The following program deals with controversial subjects. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. The viewer is invited to make a judgment based on all available information. Tonight on Sightings, many thought the mystery of the English crop circles was a hoax, but our ongoing investigation has uncovered startling evidence that may prove extraterrestrial contact. This intelligence is almost certainly not human. Then, what sinister spell has cursed the British royalty for 600 years? We uncover the royal curse tonight. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. Since the early 1980s, over 2,000 crop circle formations have been discovered in 30 countries, and new ones are being reported every month. Theories about where they come from range from weather anomalies to extraterrestrials to crazed hedgehogs doing a mating dance. Well, obviously, some theories are more credible than others, but the fact remains that something is happening in fields around the world that no one can fully explain. The stories of unexplained designs appearing mostly in the farm fields of England hit an all-time high in 1990. News media from around the world were quick to hail these enigmatic circles and lines as the strangest scientific discovery of the 20th century. For a brief period, crop circles became the darling of popular culture. But then, two hoaxers stepped forward to claim that they had created the crop circles. And just as quickly as the phenomenon began, the media dropped the crop circle story. The hoax theory stuck, and soon the only people still interested were hardcore theorists and scientists. Initially, uh, they, these were uh, simple single circles, but in 1990, the patterns be there, became much more uh, complex, uh, dramatically so, and uh, blew right out of the water some of the early theories. The early formations were um, the size of a domestic uh, room, um, now you have formation which are the, uh, the, almost the size of Central Park. So that we have um, enormous growth, both in complexity and in size and in numbers. Michael Green is an archaeologist and architecture historian who is also one of the founding members of the Center for Crop Circle Studies. We're not a religious cult. Uh, we're not a, a strange, wacky branch of the UFO movement. Um, we are trying to use uh, rational means to establish what's going on. And the first thing we learnt, and um, this year in particular, is that there are a few hoaxes. Uh, I'm Dave Chorley, this is Doug Barr, and we are the two people that have created the crop circles in 1978 through to today. The most impressive thing to me, and the reason why I actually stopped and listened to what they had to say, was not really what they told me, but what they did in the field. Because when they did the demonstration out uh, in Sussex at Chilgrove, um, the formation itself was um, quite messy. But it was amazing how quickly it happened. In 45, 40, 45 minutes, this huge formation was laid down. And that's even accounting for the fact that half the world's press were tramping around it as well with them, asking them for interviews at the same time. But Doug and Dave had only done a few of the hundreds of circles that had been done. And from the uh, evidence, their public demonstrations in broad daylight, they weren't very good at it. But no one really knew what hoaxes could do and what they couldn't do. And so I thought, well, here's an ideal opportunity for an, a scientific experiment. Uh, and the best way to do it is through a competition. Biologist and author Rupert Sheldrake did organize a competition held earlier this year. The challenge was to see if anyone could create crop circles that could not be identified as hoaxes. The circles were made at night, and the next day, the contest winners demonstrated their techniques. What we found was that the standard of um, artificial circle making was much higher than most people had expected. These people could do very well. The standard was very high indeed. And the most surprising thing was that people could do all this in complete darkness with making very little noise.
I flew the site the next day, and the aerial pictures that we took show some of the centers of these formations displaying exactly the characteristics that the genuine circles have displayed, and exactly the characteristics that many of the experts have said couldn't be done by people. Things like making rings without having a hole in the center where somebody stands. Things like producing a, a radial effect where the crop splays out from a central point. And the team that won and the team that came second and third produced really marvelous formations which the judges were very impressed by. So what they show is that many of the features of crop circles could be hoaxes, but they don't show that they are hoaxes. And, I mean, the, the analogy that um, I find most helpful is the fact the fact you can forge a $20 bill doesn't prove that all $20 bills are forgeries. The first and primary feature which is evident in the genuine phenomenon and not in the hoaxes is the spiralling fingerprint. Colin Andrews heads up the Circles Phenomenon Research Group in Bradford, Connecticut. He has co-authored two books on crop circles and is believed to have visited more actual crop circle sites than any other researcher. This particular uh, screen shows clearly the difference between the fingerprint, this is the print at the top here, uh, of the genuine phenomenon, the real phenomenon, and uh, all of those hoaxes which we're hearing so much about these days. Andrews believes that the most important patterns to be studied are those where the flow of the crops changes direction within a single circle, a pattern no human has yet been able to duplicate in public. I think the single most convincing argument uh, for a real phenomenon and against the hoax uh, are the effects that the phenomenon are, are having upon the plants themselves. Dr. Levingood, uh, a well-known physicist in the United States, has discovered uh, changes in, in the, uh, uh, the structure of the plants themselves, in cell structure of the plants, molecular st structure of the plants, on a number of continents. When a formation hits, it just knocks the heck out of the embryo. They don't grow, they, they, the seeds don't develop. Dr. Levengood has discovered that the cell structure of the crops within a formation are distinctly different from undisturbed crops nearby, and that this new cell structure seriously alters the crop's growth. Let me get this straight. A plant that is in a formation undergoes an internal change so that seeds taken from that plant grow a different kind of plant or an altered plant? Altered in the, both the growth rate and the germination. In some cases, it increases quite significantly. Some people maintain that hoaxsters created not only some, but all of these formations. You buy that? Oh, God, no. No, this is this is utterly ridiculous. No. If they had that kind of energy, they wouldn't be wasting it out in the field making impressions in a crop. It would be a new kind of energy distribution, let's say, that I have never heard of. Mathematician Gerald Hawkins is another scientist with an intriguing theory. Professor Hawkins made his mark in the 1950s when he came up with an explanation for Stonehenge still accepted today. Now, Hawkins has devised a mathematical formula relating the crop circles to the notes of a musical scale. Help us understand that. You're not suggesting that because there's a relationship between the ratios of the crop circles and the ratios of musical tones that you can somehow play the crop circles. I'm not saying that the crop circles are musical. I'm saying that they follow the same mathematical law as the major diatonic scale. No natural physical process that we know will generate the diatonic scale, which is, of course, the white notes on the piano. Therefore, the only theory that we can put forward is that it's done by human beings, it's all a hoax. But they're clever hoaxes, and if it's not a hoax, then we have a major scientific problem on our hands. Professor Hawkins has studied the ratios of the sizes of crop circles and found the same ratios between notes in the diatonic scale. If the music doesn't seem listenable, then it seems to imply there's something beyond music being communicated here. Yes, it could be a copyright insignia of the primary hoaxes or the crop circle makers, and perhaps they may use this uh, later for further information transmission. But I'm not going to predict what crop circle makers will do next. Dr. Hawkins, you're implying that if even one of the crop circles is not the work of a hoaxer, that science will have to rethink everything? I'm afraid so. You only need one in this case, and you have a mystery. What, of course, stands out 
clearly now is that we have the uncomfortable fact that this intelligence is almost certainly not human. And this is where people become extremely nervous. The media becomes very nervous. The press becomes extremely nervous. They don't like mysteries like this. One of the reasons that some thinkers have thought might be behind this is the position of the Earth in terms of the terrible damage that is being done by man. Could we be dealing with something which is trying to warn us? Either it's very skillful hoaxes with a tremendous sense of humor, um, or it's some non-human intelligence that's completely off the scale of anything that we've uh, contemplated so far. But if they are communications of Gaia or nature or, or aliens or whatever, if they're communications of some kind from a non-human source, it's not quite clear what they're saying. Their main uh, message so far seems to be, watch this space. Are we any closer today to unraveling the mystery of what or who created the crop circles? Joining me now is George Wingfield, director of field research and founding member of the Center for Crop Circle Studies in London, England. George, welcome to Sightings. Hello, Tim. The crop circles have changed over the years. The shapes have changed, the number have changed. Have you learned anything from those directions? Uh, there's now no doubt at all that these are of some sort of intelligent origin and this appears to be non-human. What do the circles seem to be leading toward? I think they are leading us towards an understanding of some other level of uh, intelligence which is not human. Do you believe, George, that the crop circles are an ancient phenomenon, that they've always been there, they just haven't been accounted for by, by modern means? No, I don't think so. I don't think so at all. I think the crop circles uh, started appearing uh, in quite recent times, probably less than 30 years ago. There may have been uh, a few before that, but very, very few. For you, do the crop circles inspire hope or fear or merely curiosity? Well, they certainly inspire hope. Um, I believe the whatever is causing the circles is something which is benign. I don't believe there's anything hostile or evil here, which is what some people would have you to believe. George Wingfield, thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. And we'll be back with more sightings in just a moment. Coming up next, what sinister spell has cursed the royal family for 600 years? You can't escape it. We reveal the secrets of the royal curse next. In the past two years, Britain's royal family has endured an unprecedented amount of scrutiny and negative press. And some people are not surprised because they believe the House of Windsor is suffering under an ancient curse. Are the Windsor curse and the current royal troubles just coincidence? Or can a curse really create scandal, hardship, and even death? A curse is one of the most ancient forms of ritual still surviving today. It can be an elaborate spell or hasty words. King Tut's tomb was believed to be cursed and some of those who entered it did die under unusual circumstances. The Hope Diamond, the largest in the world, is also thought to carry a curse. But can people really be harmed by something that many believe is merely superstition? A uh, curse is uh, magic, black magic. That is a negative wish that is, can be made by word of mouth, by saying something that would harm somebody, anybody can be uh, victimized, anybody is uh, vulnerable. Throughout this century, Britain's royal family has been the object of scandal and tragedy. From the abdication of Edward VIII to the bloody terrorist attack that killed Prince Charles' favorite uncle. Recent revelations about Princess Diana's unhappy marriage and Fergie's impending divorce from Prince Andrew are just the latest misfortunes that some believe are caused by a little-known royal curse. If such a curse exists, could it explain why, for the first time, the role of the whole British monarchy is being questioned, and some are even calling for its end? In 1986, speculation arose that the personal and public misfortunes of the House of Windsor were due to a centuries-old curse. It was believed to have first taken its toll on the Queen Mother's family in the early 19th century at their ancestral home in Scotland. Rumors about the curse surfaced after it was revealed that two nieces of the Queen Mother, thought to be dead,
had actually been hidden away in a mental hospital for over 40 years. The nieces, Nerissa and Catherine Bowes Lyon, are also first cousins to Queen Elizabeth, who is a direct descendant of the Bowes Lyon family. The fact is that the Queen has an enormous number of cousins, and if you looked through the list of them all, you would find all sorts of, um, you know, unfortunate characters. So too, there were two nieces of the Queen Mother who um, it was understood and indeed published that they had died many years ago. And what happened was that they were born mentally deficient. What actually happened in 1986 um, was that both these women were alive and well at this stage. Um, it is not known whether or not the Queen Mother um, knew about their existence. Uh, it was a scandal at the time because it left a tarnished image on the woman that was otherwise the, known as the, um, the nation's favorite granny. The origin of the royal curse is believed to date back to the 17th century and Gloms Castle in northeastern Scotland. Gloms is the ancestral home of the Bowes Lyon family. Here in the 1600s, the Lord of Gloms Castle made an error in judgment that many believe the current royal family is still paying for. One of these stories is um, a result of the feud that existed between the Ogilvy and the Lindsay family. Uh, and, and the story says that uh, a group of Ogilvies were fleeing from the Lindsays and came to Glam's and asked for uh, shelter. And the story says that what he did was to give them shelter in a small room in the thickness of the wall, but then he closed them in and eventually that room was uh, walled up. And of course they died a, a terrible death. The Ogilvies were entombed in Glam's castle for over 100 years. When their chamber was finally opened in the 1700s, a grisly discovery was made. They had been so desperately hungry before they died that they'd even got to the stage of eating their own limbs. At least one of the skeletons had his teeth uh, around his forearm. Some believe that when the wall came down, a curse was let loose upon the residents of the castle, a curse conjured up by the murdered members of the Ogilvy clan. The first manifestation of the curse is thought to have occurred in 1821 with the birth of the then Earl's firstborn son, Thomas Bowes Lyon, the great, great, great uncle of Queen Elizabeth. He was a, um, if you like, a hybrid between Quasimodo and Phantom of the Opera. His entire body was covered with hair, almost like an ape. He had uh, no arm, well, very small arms and very small legs. And uh, when his father, the 11th Earl, saw uh, his son and heir, he was so horrified that uh, he banished him from his sight. And the story even goes that he lived to be 100 years old, which would mean that he was still alive in 1921. There is a sort of infamous story about the Glam's monster, um, but frankly, I don't know anything about it. I mean, as far as, as we are concerned here at Glam's, it simply never happened. The curse of Glam's castle has never been openly discussed by the royal family. Any discussion about the curse is vigorously denied by anyone employed by the family. Family take very strong uh, exceptions to that particular story. Um, and again, as far as they're concerned, it's a load of rubbish. It is interesting that uh, it's a way to get a very, very frosty royal look, is if you mention this monster and any story about it in the presence of the Queen Mother or any of her immediate family. They've never actually commented on the story on the record. Um, but when the Queen Mother's biographer, James Wentworth Day, went to interview Countess Granville, the Queen Mother's sister, in 1967, shortly before her death, she simply turned around and said that she, she was never allowed to discuss this, and her father and grandfather had point blank banned them from discussing it. If a society is strongly believing that curse can affect you, then it must, by its very nature, affect. You can't escape it, you give in. Will the curse ever end for the royal family? Or are they destined to eternal tragedy because of the murderous act of one of the Queen Mother's misguided ancestors? Some historians suggest yet another possible reason for the royal curse. At Gloms Castle in 1537, Lady Gloms, the beautiful widow of the sixth Earl, was accused of being a witch. She was burned alive. And ever since her death, strange supernatural phenomena have plagued the castle. Coming up next, does the cousin of the Loch Ness Monster lurk in the depths of Lake Champlain? 
swings his entire body around and lifts his neck and head out of the water entirely. On a recent special edition of Sightings, we reported on Operation Deep Scan, the latest scientific search for proof of the existence of the Loch Ness Monster. Now an update on the findings of Operation Deep Scan and information about a lake monster sighted right here in the United States. Operation Deep Scan, the most comprehensive and sophisticated search of Loch Ness to date, did come up with an important new sighting. Using sonar, an unexplained creature of large proportions was tracked through the murky lake for more than two miles. Sightings of a similar nature have also occurred in Lake Champlain, along the New York-Vermont border. Recently, increased attention has been focused on the lake after three separate eyewitnesses captured video of what they believe is Champ, the Loch Ness Monster's American cousin. It was a huge black mat. It was just monster. It was scary. It was, it was that big. Up came the neck and the head, literally like my hand is doing. It turned and it looked at me and it turned and it went right back down into the water. He swings his neck around and lifts his tail up, his, swings his entire body around and lifts his neck and head out of the water entirely. Does a loop and you know, a whole big arch like this in the water and dives back in. A sightings investigative team is currently monitoring Lake Champlain. We'll bring you a full updated report of our findings in the coming weeks. Input from viewers is an important part of our sightings investigations. If you videotaped or photograph what you believe to be paranormal activity, our sightings investigative team wants to know about it. To report your sightings, call the sightings hotline at 1-900-740-SITE. That's 1-900-740-SITE. Each call 75 cents a minute. Average call lasts two minutes and you must be 18 years or older. Again, the sightings hotline is 1-900-740-7483. On the next sightings from the newly accessible Russian Republic, startling eyewitness evidence of bizarre extraterrestrial contact. And then, a special update on the Iceman. What ancient secrets has he revealed on the next sightings? Join us next time for new investigations into the unexplained. For sightings, I'm Tim White. The world's top wrestlers battle for championship gold on Saturday night's main event, right after Cops. It's a night of crime and punishment, hosted by Al Bundy, tomorrow. Coming up, a renowned psychic is murdered. Who did it, and why didn't he see it coming? You solve the mystery when L.A. Law's Corbin Burnson guest stars on Likely Suspects, next.